are back in our wonderful book on Christ-centered worship and I pray that you've been blessed. The Lord have really started working in your mind concerning what He requires from us, how we can be a more effective worshiping community, bringing God the glory that is due to Him and that you start experiencing the joy of worshiping God and realizing that everything you do has related to worship. Now, previous lesson, uh, there were some questions for you to review. And uh, we looked at the New Testament teaches that the Old Testament form of temple worship are now absolute. And what are the basis of this? And is it true? And we've seen how Christ has fulfilled so many of the requirements of the law. And I'm really blessed to present this course to you, even though I've been a theologian and a pastor and a teacher for more than 25 years. I've learned so much in this course. So I honor God for our time together studying Christ-centered worship. It can really change the way we do church. It should transform us because uh, we are sometimes so limited in our thinking. And it is so wonderful to work with the Word of God because there's so much more we can still learn. There's so much more of God we can still experience. And uh, it is my prayer that in your journey with God you will experience the fullness of His presence manifesting in your church as you worship Him. Uh, I know we all have a longing for God to revive us. And if you study the history of the church and you look at all the great revivals, it's just so wonderful that God broke through into a place and a time and visit a specific people group so tremendously that that revival transformed the society. And it is my prayer that in my lifetime I will experience some form of revival where God will just break through, like in the Old Testament, where He came with a cloud and He dwelled amongst His people. Uh, when the tabernacle was inaugurated and again when Solomon dedicated the temple. So it is my prayer of my heart that as we journey together, we will hear of the testimonies of us as participants in Leadership International, how God have manifested his presence as we worship him and transforming our lives and then we transform the society among which God has placed us. In lesson six we're gonna become more practical with, with uh, going through all the theories of the Old Testament, the Div Divinic songs and worship methods, how Christ fulfilled it and now we're gonna look how can we apply this in our churches? How we can uh, learn what we've used and uh, see that being applied in the lives of ourselves and of our congregations. This lesson starts with an over, overview question which says, does it matter how we worship? And of course the answer is yes. The lesson contains a brief survey of the requirements of God to respond to Him as He directs. And then it con includes some comparisons, what theologians call normative and regulative principles. So two new words for you to learn today, normative and regulative principles in worship. Uh, then a thorough explanation of these terms, what is requirements and the styles of practice. So let us look at the regulative principle. So it starts there on page 42a, does it matter? Since weekly corporate worship is to be the practical of the practice of the church, how uh, does it matter how we worship together on the day of the Lord? And the answer is yes. Does it matter how we worship? We can see evidence of uh, this in the first offering of worship in the Bible, Abel offered an acceptable offering to God and Cain, his brothers, his offering was uh, rejected. And that, of course, 
led to the first murder in the, in the, in the, in the history. So we read in Genesis 4, 6 and 7, Then the Lord said to Canaan, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. A beautiful revelation of what happened. Cain uh, was of course angry with God and he became jealous of his brother because God accepted his sacrifice and not Cain's. And how they worship was the matter. Canaan, he brought vegetables. He was a vegetable farmer and Abel was uh, an animal farmer. He farmed with sheep and cattle. And of course God accepted Abel's sacrifice because he sacrificed and worship in the right manner and Cain not. And he, Cain was so offended that he murdered his brother. Another example how God responded to worship with disfavor was Aaron's uh, two sons. We read in uh, the book of Leviticus chapter 10 and I'm going to read out of the, today's English version from 1 to 3. He said Aaron, sons are Tap and Abihu each took his fire pan, put live coals on it, added incense and presented it to the Lord. But the fire was not holy because the Lord had not commanded them to present it. Suddenly the Lord sent fire and it burned them to death there in the presence of the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord was speaking about when he said, All who serve me must respect my holiness. I will reveal my glory to my people. This is of course a horrible story. Aaron's sons being young priests, they were careless in their way of worship. Maybe they were late and they just quickly threw the fire and the coals and the incense together and hurried up and it presented to God. But it was not in the way God told them to do it. And God's fury turned into flames and this act of worship was an act of disrespect to God and they got killed because they did not respect God's holiness. So yes, two right foundation, right here in the beginning is two foundational principles for us to take note at. The story of Cain and Abel. Abel of course brought the right sacrifice and he found favor with God. And Abel, who did not bring the right sacrifice, did not find favor with God, and that caused him to be jealous of his brother. So here we see a principle of when God really blesses us and we walk with God, there will be jealousy from other churches to us. And that really makes me sad when, when I look at the history and as I've been traveling around the world quite a lot uh, in Africa and Asia. You know, there's some, some jealousy among churches, among each other. God blesses one and the people that is not blessed are jealous. And they despise that. Instead of really sincerely repenting. And this really calls us as pastors to uh, reflect on our attitude to other churches. We are building God's kingdom and the kingdom comes through the church. We are not building our churches as a means to an end. Our church serves the kingdom of God and if we have a kingdom mind and honestly seeking God we will work with other churches because we are the light in the world and the more we work together the brighter the light will shine. And then the other one is we should never be careless about worship. It's not just something you do in your routine. Oh let's go to church and you house hurriedly prepare your service and you you don't thoroughly prepare your worship. It offends God. And here is the story of Aaron's two sons being killed because they were careless about how they worship. It says there, but Aaron remained silent. It struck him. Can you, can you imagine as a father your two sons were supposed to take over your ministry 
in are careless about the ministry and they strike dead, what fear would fill our congregation if God would reveal His holiness and our sin is exposed and our sin causes us to fall dead before Him. It happened in the New Testament church with Ananias and Sapphira. They were careless about honesty and it causes them their death. So it's serious, serious matters, my friend, but the reward is worth it. When God's divine presence manifests in our midst, our lives are transformed and we experience something about the supernatural in our midst, which deep in us is a longing. So even though there's a warning, it should not uh, cause us not to strive for the holiness and the presence of God to be manifested as we worship Him. So now we will look at the Ten Commandments and each one of them revealed to us something about the seriousness and the rewards of really honesty seeking God. So the first command of course is God-centered and the last six is man-centered. So it is clear directions for worship and the implications. So the first one is about the exclusivity of worshiping only God. Remember the previous verse in Exodus it says, I am the Lord your God who have saved you from your slavery. So God is the Savior and then He's the lawgiver. So because He saved us, He wants to continue to save us from ourselves and from wrongful ways of worship and therefore He revealed to us how we should go into His presence. And the first one is of course we can serve no other God. He is the only Savior and we must only serve Him as our Lord and Savior. There is no place for other gods beside Him. The second command forbids idol making and follows from the first. And this is uh, really, really touches my life because even though we do not have idols and the only uh, main religion on this world today that have physical idols is the Hindus of India. Uh, many, uh, most other religions don't have idols, like Islam don't have idols. Buddhism have uh, a form of a Buddha which is looks like an idol, but they don't worship the idol, they worship what that idol represent. Uh, so is animism, uh, the spirit world. So idols are much more subtle in our life so we are forbidden to make idols and that also includes us as Christians to create our own image what we think God should be like to constrain God to a God who sits in heaven listening to our demands for material wealth that is a form of idol worship another form of idol worship we find sometimes in Africa is where the Africans who came out of animism want some holy water and they believe if the pastor pray for the water the water is holy and if that water is used uh, on their vegetables or there's some magical power in it that's a form of idol worship because it's a form that is not commanded to us in scripture it's, there's no biblical ground for that we should worship only God we should not put our faith in holy water that is a form of idol worship that have subtly come into the church and have become a great way of money making uh, in the church in some African countries. So God is spirit and because we, He is spirit we are forbidden to make anything which looks like Him or represent Him. On a broader sense we are also excluded from heart idols or we might say lifestyle idols so Christ is our Savior and we are commanded that there is no competitor Savior and sometimes we look at other things in life to fulfill our desires like sex and money and materialism and education things we value and we strive for and things we put effort into and it consumes our time and we make those things the focus of our worship. 
The third command is the faithfulness of Jehovah's name. Most believers often think of the profanity when they read the command, but it goes deeper. Violating this command is deflammatory, wicked and rebellious language against God. You can read in Psalm 74. Uh, it is prohibition against cursing other people, whether in oath form or simply calling someone an idiot, uh, where Jesus spoke about. It pertains to worship, however, it is connected to the sacraments of the Old uh, Testament circumcision and the New Testament baptism, which are both performed in God's name. The sacraments are an oath of loyalty to the covenant of the Lord. To live a shadow religious life as a baptized, seldom worshipping Christian is a violation of this command. Something to think of. Nominal Christ Christians is an offense. You cannot just call upon the name and say, I'm a Christian, but your lifestyle don't reflect that. That is profanity and it is sinful. And the fourth one prohibits work on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath set is set apart as holy unto the Lord as a day of rest and a day of worship. So how we treat our day of worship is also important. So that brings us, my friend, to two primary ways in which we interpret scripture concerning worship. So one group of churches, these Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox Episcopalians, the Anglicans and the Lutherans, are committed what is called the normative principle. The normative principle, and they say whatever is not forbidden by scripture is permissible in worship. So listen very carefully, whatever is not forbidden in scripture is permissible. So scripture is not clearly saying you must not do this, you cannot do this, you can do that. So that is what we call the normative principle. Normative principle means whatever is not forbidden in scripture is permissible in worship. That's the one end. Then the other one is called the regulative principle and there we have the Baptist, Congregational, Presbyterian churches and this is more restrictive. So this principle says only that which is commanded or directly inferred from scripture is permissible in worship. So we can only do what scripture allows us. The other one says if it's not directly forbidden in scripture we can allow it. This principle says if we can only do what is commanded by scripture and is permissive. We cannot, we don't have the freedom to interpret our own ways. So there's a reference to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So it is a confession of faith for people who came together and they said this is how we understand our faith, how we can apply our faith better in our acts of worship. So it's very interesting to, to learn and to read these confessions of faith because it's really meaningful and explanatory for us how to verbalize our understanding of faith in a more formative way and how do we apply it in, in, in our church. So let us read at the Westminster Confession point 21 verse 1 says, The light of nature shows that there is a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and does good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted, and served, with all the heart, and with all the soul, and with all the might. But the acceptable way of worshipping the true God is instituted by Him Himself. That is very uh, key for this. The way we should worship the true God is instituted by God himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may be worshipped according, oh, sorry, that he may not be worshipped according to the imitations and devices of men or the suggestions by Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in scripture. So here it is, we worship God according how He revealed and we must not allow our lives to be dictated by the worldly systems, by devices of men or tempted by Satan to, to worship God in a way that is not 
directly described in scripture. The church does not have legislative power. The church cannot have the option to choose between good and evil or right or wrong. We have to obey. That is a saying from Dr. Reggie Kitt, uh, which means the statement that the church does not have the authority from God to write the laws of worship. That is God's authority alone. God wrote the laws of worship. And if we want to worship Him, we have to comply with His laws. Otherwise, we cannot enter into His presence. And we cannot worship Him and we are if we do not comply to God's ways of worshipping, we are actually busy with idolatry. So let us look at the requirements, the styles and the practices. So the regulative principle generally distinguishes between three aspects of public worship. Requirements, styles and practices. Again, I'm going to say requirements. The requirements which is clearly defined in scripture, the styles of worship, we're going to look at that, and the practices. Understanding these aspects will guide the church in acceptable public worship. Isn't that beautiful? God has set some boundaries, and in these boundaries, we can really meet Him. That is where He dwells. The requirements are the specific instructions from God of how He must be worshipped, those things that the Westminster Confession of Faith say are prescribed in Holy Scriptures. Requirements of those activities God has instituted for His worship in Scripture, either by precepts, normative example, or good and necessary implications. So the Westminster Confession of Faith lists some of them. It's prayer, reading of Scripture, reading of the Word, Singing, psalms, sacraments, basic requirements of worship. It's also included occasional religious oaths, vows, offerings, fasting and testimonies. So here's another list. It is read the Bible, preach the Bible, sing the Bible, pray the Bible and see the Bible in the sacraments. That's a beautiful uh, analogy. So prayer, song, preaching, reading of scripture, tithing, offerings and ordinances. That is the requirement. So what is the styles? Are the kind of psalms, the way scriptures read, the approach to preaching, the musical style of singing, and how sacraments are to be celebrated along with the worship order. Whereas the requirements are prescribed, there is considerable freedom in style. Although the style should be consistent with the nature of the requirement. Here are some styles seen or implied in scripture. So God has given us freedom to accommodate or to adapt, to change our styles of worship that is unique to our culture. You know God created culture but Satan deformed culture and he turned it into some forms of wickedness. So deep in our culture there is some godly ways which we should keep because that is our identity. Our identity in our ethnicity, our ethnic group. I am originally, my forefathers came from Europe to Africa, but deep in my heart I'm a European. Yet I understand Africans because for four uh, generations we've been living in Africa. I've also been traveling to Asia so I understand something about the Asian culture. So each culture has some unique requirements and unique contributions and that shouldn't be lost. Now it's really sad when one culture dominates the world of worship. We must really, like Christ was incarnated into the Hebrew culture, so we must Take the truth incarnated into our culture and use our culture within the limits which God has revealed and build beautiful worship which our people can identify with. Prayer. So prayer can be corporate or individual. It means we can pray together. I know there's some cultures where everybody prays aloud together. 
some people find that disturbing. They not grown up in a corp, uh, in a communitative culture, so they want individual prayers. People pray one after the other. I know in Nepal everybody prays together at the same time. When I first got there, it was very difficult for me to pray with them because I was not used to it. But it's much more meaningful because you don't have to spend an hour in a prayer meeting, each one praying only two or three minutes. No, you can pray half an hour and all of all the people pray together. So it's something cultural, but it is unique to that culture or some other cultures in the world. That is beautiful and we comply to the requirements of prayer. It can be written ahead of time or read in unison or prayer spontaneously. It can be scriptural or specified form from the Lord's Prayer. So there's some limitations and regulations which we can apply. We can be praised, thanksgiving, intercession, supplication, lament or confu confession. It can be sitting, kneeling, standing, lying down with our hands raised or be sung. So you see the style of worship can, can change. Then the scripture reading can be corporate, everybody reads aloud together or somebody reads to the rest of the congregation. It can be individual sentences or verses or whole chapters or book. It can be Old Testament or New Testament. It can be unison, have a leader. It can be responses, uh, self or and phonal or read dramatically in a group can be creeds, oaths and vows so a form of reading during our worship preaching should always be Christ-centered and it is the nature of the element so with the preaching comes the preacher that is why you've learned principles of interpretation that is why you've learned techniques how to preach don't allow somebody who don't know how to apply and understand scripture or how to preach to minister through preaching in the, in, the, in the congregation. It is irresponsible because people may be a good public speaker but they are horrible preacher. So we as church should guard over who preaches and what is being preached. Can be prophetic, instructional, evangelistic or blended. Can be topical or systematically can be dramatically, can be singing in scripture includes various forms of music, can be corporate or individual, can be congregational, choir or solo, can be celebration of joy or in moaning or in lament, songs can be short, repetitive or long or epic, can be in any music style or any culture, of any culture, singing can be loud or soft, melodic or percussive and many include dancing or hand raise. So do what is comfortable and traditional to your culture. The sacraments should be congregational and part of the nature of the elements. So the first one is communion. Depending on the size of the church can be weekly, monthly, occasional, can be seated and people can be served or everybody can come forward and be served by some leader in the church. There's freedom concerning the quality and the quantity of the bread and the cup. That you as church can decide. Baptism can be indoors and outdoors. Uh, it can be uh, immersion. Traditionally people in the New Testament will emerge into the water after the confession of faith. There is some guidelines in uh, the, the early church fathers when they baptized somebody in the desert and there wasn't a lot of water and then the people were poured out. So it is important what does the baptism represent and we've studied that in detail. Offerings, part of worship, can be a collection of money uh, but it should be directed as a worship towards God our provider and the focus of our congregation and our gathering is not to bring money so that the pastor can make a living. No. Bringing money towards the church is an act of worship. We serve God as an act of worship with our money. But God had decided that in his Old Testament system the Levites should get paid out of the offerings because they dedicate their life to worship and to serve 
God as priests. In the New Testament we have pastors and God have decided that pastors should be paid out of the offerings. Some of the offerings should go to the missions and to different areas which the Bible gives us direction. But one of the areas where the church is responsible is to pay the pastor a livable income so that he can minister. Then there should be testimonies which should be Christ-centered. So if you do not know a person, don't allow them to speak. But when God have done some great things, let the people testify. Practices or practical concerns such as a worship place, language, time, clothing, local customs and holidays. How should that be described? These things are not prescribed in scripture and they will vary from place to place. So there is some uniqueness of our cultural inheritance that should be reflected. So summarize. We are not free to invent the way in which we are to worship God. Although the practice matters of where and when we worship are free, the requirements and the aspects of offering are clearly commanded and meant to be followed. It is tempting for each culture and each generation to bless their own traditions. Music and style are superior to others, more God-pleasing. But by God's grace, the gospel is embedded in every culture in some way. There is not a single culture or era that, is, that fully contains the gospel. Every culture needs to be transformed and every culture has something to offer of the traditions to make up the history of worship. One day we will stand before God from every tribe, nation and language. Our uniqueness will be celebrated in heaven. Why not start practicing that on earth? So one voice who is Christ and many styles and traditions throughout the church points to his voice. So now my friends, in your class you're going to do this exercise. In groups of three, share with one another one of your favorite hymns or songs. You can even sing it if you like to sing that. As a group, write down two or three related scripture passages and one or more attributes of God and Christ mentioned in the hymn or song shared by you. So follow that and then again there's 10 review questions. So for the uh, last part of this lesson, into groups and then discuss these 10 questions. You can go through them one by one and uh, answer them, discuss them. And it is up to the facilitator if you want the students to do that and write it out and give it to you before the next lesson. That is the freedom you have as the class facilitator. May God bless you.